Roman empresses sported some of history's most formidable hairdos. From elaborate tiered diadems, to rigid rows of braids, to monumental towers of curls. Although the hairstyles of the emperors were much less eye-catching, they're equally intriguing. An emperor's hair and beard were important parts of his public image, carefully chosen, advertised to millions, and imitated throughout the empire. Before we explore the messages implicit in the emperor's portraits, a bit of background. Early in Roman history, men wore their hair and beards long, probably in styles influenced by their Etruscan neighbors. Shorter hair had become customary by the Middle Republic, as we can see from this coin portrait of Titus Flaminius, produced at the beginning of the 2nd century BC. The Roman elite began to shed their beards in the mid-2nd century BC, inspired by Greek fashion. Scipio Aemilianus, conqueror of Carthage, was remembered as the first Roman to shave daily. During the turbulent final decades of the Republic, as members of the aristocracy jockeyed for power and position, hairstyle became an important element of self-presentation. Caesar's rival Pompey, pictured here, imitated the upswept hair of Alexander the Great. When Octavian, the future Augustus, came to prominence in the wake of Caesar's death, he emphasized the fact that he was Caesar's adopted son and heir by allowing his hair to grow long and not shaving his beard, both traditional signs of mourning in Roman culture. Later, when he became sole ruler of the Roman world, he created a new official portrait in which his hair was combed over his forehead in comma-shaped locks. His hair didn't actually look like this on a daily basis. In fact, if we can believe Suetonius, he was so impatient that he had his hair trimmed by three barbers working simultaneously. But he wanted to be seen this way. Augustus was a young man when he came to power, and he maintained an image of dynamic youth throughout his long reign. The thick hair of his portraits, inspired by classical statues of Greek athletes, were part of that image. In portraits, if not in reality, the first emperor's hairstyle was imitated by his successors. Even Caligula, who was balding, had himself depicted with those Augustan, comma-shaped locks across his forehead. Unlike the other Julio-Claudians, Nero had himself portrayed realistically on both statues and coins which unflinchingly document his growing obesity. Nero's portraits also illustrate his hairstyle, which was longer and more elaborate than his predecessors. According to Suetonius, Nero favored rows of crescent-shaped curls, arranged step-like along the forehead. He also grew, or at least had himself depicted with, a remarkably unprepossessing neck beard. Though this was probably a sign of his fascination with all things Greek. In Nero's time, Greeks were far likelier than Romans to have facial hair. A beard was also a way for the young emperor to emphasize his maturity and liken himself to Hercules, patron of Greek athletics. For our purposes, the most interesting member of the Flavian dynasty, which came to power after Nero's death, is Domitian. He wasn't a great ruler. In fact, he was something of a megalomaniacal tyrant. But he had great wigs. His wigs even appeared in official portraits. If you look closely at this bust of Domitian, you'll notice the seam between the emperor's forehead and his hairpiece. Domitian was extremely sensitive about his baldness, to the point of forbidding anyone to so much as mention hair loss in his presence. He even wrote a book on hair care, in which he lamented the lost locks of his youth. Domitian was far from alone. Two out of three men begin to experience hair loss by the age of 35. But unlike Domitian, we can now turn to this video's sponsor, Keeps, a subscription service that helps men keep their hair. Keeps offers treatments personalized for your needs and delivered straight to your door, all for a fraction of the cost of a traditional pharmacy. The effectiveness of Keeps products has been clinically proven, and most users notice results within six months. So, whether you're trying to stop hair loss, prevent hair loss, or just take better care of your hair, don't be like Domitian. Try Keeps. Hair loss stops with Keeps. To get 50% off your first order, go to keeps.com slash toldenstone, 
or click on the link in the description. Again, that's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash Toltenstone. Back to the emperors. For well over a century, most emperors tried to look, at least in their portraits, more or less like Augustus, shaving clean and imitating the first emperor's hairstyle. Trajan, with those Augustan bangs combed over his forehead, was no exception. Trajan's successor Hadrian, however, wore his hair longer, with a fringe that seems to have been artificially curled with hot irons. More dramatically, Hadrian was the first emperor, with the partial and regrettable exception of Nero, to have a beard. The beard may have been a sign of his fascination with all things Greek, a throwback to the Roman past, or a nod to Zeus. Or perhaps, as one Roman author speculated, the emperor was just trying to cover his acne scars. Hadrian's successors imitated both his beard and, to varying degrees, his curled hair. As you can see from this portrait, Lucius Verus had a spectacular mop of curls, which he liked to sprinkle with gold dust. Sculptors used their most refined drilling and polishing techniques to capture every wave and eddy. Marcus Aurelius, Verus's co-emperor, had a longer and fuller beard than any previous emperor. This reflected his stoic leanings. It was conventional to show philosophically inclined men with full beards, which advertised an intellectual indifference to anything so frivolous as daily grooming. Beards could also convey other messages. Portraits of Septimius Severus, for example, feature a forked beard meant to evoke a famous statue of the god Serapis. New fashions emerged in the 3rd century as emperors, faced with multiplying military crises, began to have themselves represented with the short hair and stubble beard of a soldier. This portrait of Philip the Arab is characteristic of the type. We'll leave late antique art for another video. Suffice it to say that, by the end of the 3rd century, imperial portraits had come a long way from Augustus's cultivated public image. But they were still intended as every aspect of an emperor's appearance was always intended to assure, impress, and overawe. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting Tolden Stone on Patreon. You might also enjoy my book, Naked Statues, Fat Gladiators, and War Elephants. Thanks for watching.